Hi, everybody. So we are going to talk about thermodynamics, which is something we've touched on before, and we're going to expand on some of those ideas um, from chapter five, essentially. And so um, these are the lecture notes for chapter 19, cleverly titled Chemical Thermodynamics. And um, first, a quick review to tie it into what we're going to learn in chapter 19. In 14, we learned all about kinetics, which asks the question, how fast does the reaction go? In chapters 15 through 17, we just learned about how far a reaction will go, whether it forms 100% products or um, does not form any products or maybe somewhere in between, right? Um, and so essentially, if we take those those chapters as a whole and think about the connections between them. What we figure is that we learned the rate of a reaction depends on essentially activation energy. So remember we did these little pictures, these reaction coordinate diagrams where, you know, the reaction progress is on the x-axis and you have some kind of energy unit on the, on the y-axis. And so we said, the overall rate of a reaction depends how high this hill is, right? And so if that's true, um, and if it's true that however much product you get depends on how, on that rate, on how big that hill is forward and backward, like we looked at, um, then it stands to reason uh, that energy also di dictates how much matter is produced, how much of each type of matter is produced, right? And so we were introduced to that very first idea in chapter 14 when we kind of looked at an equilibrium, I mean, not an equilibrium, sorry, a rate of reaction that happened to also be an equilibrium in a FET simulation. And we watched things go forward. And then I asked the question, okay, do you think it's gonna be mostly A or mostly B when it gets to equilibrium? And you all agreed pretty much unanimously that there's gonna be mostly B because it gets trapped here. Your, your EA for the backwards reaction is really high. And so that's the connection that we're going to pull on in order to understand thermodynamics here. Because anytime you're talking about energy, what you're really talking about is how energy moves and changes. So I asked you a question um, that, that we discussed in the discussion board and there was some back and forth and we never really got a very satisfying answer. And so the question is, can a combustion reaction be in equilibrium? Um, by the end of this chapter, you'll be able to answer that question. So first off, a quick reminder, thermodynamics means the study of heat moving. Um, but in particular, it also talks about energy and work, which are sort of work and heat are the components that make up energy. Um, it comes from a burning desire by Napoleon. That's a pun, get it? Yeah. <laughs> it comes from a burning desire from Napoleon in order to move his troops around Europe to conquer the world. He needed locomotives to be more efficient. So the story goes that in the 1820s during the Napoleonic War, he was famous for offering prizes, money, essentially, for people who could solve problems. For example, um, one of the prizes he offered was if, if somebody could invent a shelf-stable food to uh, accompany bread. It wasn't really bread. It was like hard tech, um, which is super dried up bread. Anyway, so if they could invent a shelf stable fat to go along with this hard tack for his troops to eat, he would give them a bunch of money. So a bunch of chemists realized they knew how to essentially make margarine. And that's where margarine came from. It didn't really um, exist in popular markets until after the Napoleon Wars. So similar to that, Napoleon's prize for thermodynamics was not called thermodynamics at that point. It was just make my trains move more efficiently so I can get my troops to from point A to point B much faster. Um, well, the first person to actually define the study of thermodynamics was Lord Kelvin, the same guy who invented the thermometer scale. Not invented, that's the wrong phrase. Who uh, quantified the thermometer scale might be better because it existed before Kelvin. He just gave it a name and uh, numbers, essentially. 
So Kelvin says, thermodynamics is the subject of the relation of heat to forces acting between contiguous parts of bodies in a relation of heat to electrical agency. Um, so I hope you got that. So we're done with the chapter. <laughs> Just kidding. So what he's saying here is that this study is when you're trying to find the relationship between heat and whatever magic thing happens when two things are touching. So contiguous means continuous almost. So co continuous pieces of body. So what he's saying here is when you have two things touching each other, heat will move until it's equal between those two bodies. And then he says, so besides heat moving, he's also saying it's the relationship of that movement to electricity. That's how we would say that now. They called it electric electrical agency then, but it's electricity now. All right. And so essentially it's, it's what happens when you put two objects in contact with each other, which seems really super specific. But when you remember that you are currently in contact with the air, plus probably a seat and the ground and your clothes and a whole bunch of other stuff, when you remember that, suddenly thermodynamics has an implication on everyday life, right? Because you're always in contact with something. And so by being that way, you, of course, are going to exchange heat with the universe at the very minimum. Maybe some electricity if you're staticky. Okay. So when we talk about thermodynamics, there's, there's typically three laws that are taught, but also there's a zero law that um, is implied in all of the others, okay? So I like to make that clear. It's called the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And it's just that when you have two things in contact with each other, their temperatures will be equal. Um, that also means their heats are equal. Heat and temperature are not the same thing. So here's a, here's a stumper. Can you explain the difference between heat and temperature? That's a challenging question. It might seem... Um, it might seem like they're the same thing or it might seem obviously different to you, but can you actually explain it? Um, let's make that a learning check question and we'll talk about it in class. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics says two objects in contact with each other are going to have the same temperature. The first law of thermo thermodynamics we're very familiar with. We learned about that in Chem 1 several times, but primarily in Chapter 5. So it just says energy cannot be created or destroyed. However much energy we have in the universe is what we have. End of story. The second law of thermodynamics is largely what we're going to study now in chapter 19. And it just says that the total entropy of the, entropy of the universe has to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger if anything is changing. Okay. The third law of thermodynamics we're actually not going to study at all because Essentially, it's theoretical. We can't get there. It's not measurable. We are not able to get to zero Kelvin. So what actually happens there is really unknown. Um, but <clears throat> so it's a mathematical law. And it says, though, that if entropy is zero, you have no temperature, zero Kelvin, absolute zero is what we call that, just to remind you. Um, if, if a substance is at absolute zero and it's a crystal, it's going to have a perfectly geometric ordered shape. So in other words, nothing out of place, everything exactly where it needs to be on the corner of the cube or the corner of the hexagon or whatever shape it takes on. If you have a gas at zero entropy, it will have zero volume. And then, of course, the next question is, what about liquids? I don't know. And I think that's the answer that most thermodynamic scientists would give you. We don't really have a good explanation for that. We know that really gases with a volume of zero would have to have zero matter, which is why the third law is, you know, theoretical. Um, crystals being perfectly ordered seems like something that could happen, but in reality, it does not. We can get very, very close to zero Kelvin. You can look up papers where they have gotten within a few fractions of a degree, but we can't get at zero. And weirdly, the things that happen near zero 
don't behave in a predictable normal way. You don't have a normal solid liquid or gas phase. Um, I think there was one for hydrogen. I'm gonna probably spell this wrong, but I'll try. Uh, I think it was named the Bose-Einstein condensate. It behaves weird. It's, it, it's able to, it's just hydrogen, right? Or maybe helium, one of those two. But it, it, it's so condensed, but yet can carry electrical charge, which is weird because normally neither hydrogen or helium do that. So anyway, that when you get really, really low temperatures, some strange phases happen and things don't behave the way that we think they will. But our prediction is if we could get to zero, it would have zero entry, be perfectly ordered systems. Everybody knows perfection is not a thing, right? <laughs> That's true in thermodynamics as well. So to put some equations into these laws, just to give you a reference, the zero law is the easy one. It's just temperature one of temperature of object one equals temperature of object two. Pretty straightforward. That's assuming again that they're in contact in some fashion. The first law of thermodynamics taught us that the change in energy equals heat, little q, plus work. So that's that's the conservation of mass, essentially. Or sorry, not mass. The conservation of energy. Conservation of mass was chapter four. That's when we learned how to balance equations. Conservation of energy is this one. It's just about adding up heat and work to get the total change in energy for any process. This applies to chemistry, it applies to physics, it applies to everything, okay? The second law of thermo is actually pretty simple initially when you look at it, right? And it just says that entropy, which is S, the change in entropy of the universe. So when we write these subscripts, we're saying, we're trying to identify the object. So up here, object one, object two. Down here, we're saying entropy of the entire universe is equal to the entropy change of the system plus the entropy change of the surroundings. And for any process that actually occurs, we would say anything that's spontaneous, but what we mean by that is that it happens, that delta S of the universe, that is equal to something bigger than zero. So it's gotta be a positive number or the thing doesn't happen. It's that simple. And then lastly, we have the, I didn't write this, but it's, it's the third law of thermodynamics. And it just says that when temperature is zero, entropy is also zero. We're talking about zero Kelvin, not zero Celsius, just to be clear. Here's an easier way to remember it. And there's two different versions depending on your perspective. Okay, so the zeroth law says you have to play the game. I just told you you're in contact with things. So the zeroth law always applies to you, which means all of the rest of them do as well. So you must play the game. The first law says you can't win the game. That's because there's a certain amount of energy, right? You can't, you can't get any more. You can't, you can't get any less, actually. So I guess an optimist might even say you can't lose the game either. <laughs> um, the second law says you can't break even. So while energy is limited in the universe, what's not limited is entropy. So what this means, you can't break even because entropy is always getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, the third law says, since this is impossible, that you can't quit the game. So slight modification to the first and second laws, just to clarify this. This was the first version that came out from a um, scientist. I'm never clear who it was because it gets attributed to multiple people. That's why I don't have it quoted here, but someone else came up with it, not me. The other version was re sort of refined to say, you can't win the game, you can only break even, but you can only break even if you're at absolute zero. Okay, so there's another article. There's lots of fun things about thermodynamics out there, cool pictures like matches and stuff. And uh, But this, it was an article in an actual newspaper at one point, and you can pause the video and read it. But essentially, I think every child ever has made this argument to their parents at one point or another. Essentially, why bother cleaning my room? It's just gonna get messy again. And they're not wrong. Of course it's gonna get messy again, that always happens. Um, but that's because entropy, right? Absolutely, actually, no matter how hard you try, entropy is always increasing. So let's even imagine if we had a home where nobody was living in it and it was perfectly clean and everything was put away, 
does it stay that way forever? And of course the answer is no. It, even if no animals get in there, even if, even if nothing happens to the house, you're going to have dust. You're going to have things breaking down, even if they're not getting used. Uh, eventually the whole house is going to fall down, right? And that's entropy. There's nothing we can do about it, right? I beg to differ. I'm a parent. You can definitely do something to slow entropy down. All right, but the bottom line is, even if I clean a bedroom, where does that stuff go? Right? It goes in the hallway or it goes under the bed or somewhere else. There's always entropy in the universe. Um, so why bother to clean your room, right? <laughs> of course, we clean our room so at least in one small space we have some control, some organization. Okay. So just a quick review from chapter five. We want to make sure we understand this vocab. Um, endothermic reactions are the ones that absorb energy, particularly heat. Um, so what that means about their sign is Q is positive. Okay. Which also means that typically Delta E is positive. And it means enthalpy, also positive. Things that absorb heat generally don't do a lot of work. So typically work is also positive, but not in the way you would think. Work works opposite of the way you sort of feel like it should be. 